part in the middle is looking for the center part goes. And then it goes east and west and out and out. So here's the center of our galaxy, and I just wanted to put this up to try to convey how big the place it is that we live in. Um, but about, unfortunately, the Kepler field of view is not shown in this. It's a little bit too high off the plane of the galaxy, and it's actually off the, uh, a little bit too far from the east. Um, but at about this scale, the Kepler field of view would be about four screens. Um, so you can kind of see it's just a big chunk of stars in any direction you look at. Um, if you scroll a bit, Minus a five billion pixel image. So a lot of data here. Uh, you can see all these, a number of kind of bubble like structures, like here right in the middle. You can kind of see this bubble like structure, it's right in the middle with a green rim. That's an exploded star, a supernova remnant. So those are kind of all over the place. You can see with this many stars, there's always a couple other. Probably more recent supernova limits. Right. Here is a nebula called I recognize the pillars there. It's kind of in the top, top center. So Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope has taken some very, very high resolution pictures of those pillars. So those are this is the region of active star formation stars forming them and the tips of those pillars and so forth. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, uh, those pillars, there's the kind of three pillars on the right, and then on the left, there's kind of a little more diffuse pillars. Each one of those is about 10 light years tall. Right? So at that resolution, our solar system is about four light hours in radius. So at this resolution, our solar system, all the way out to, I guess, not Pluto anymore, uh, is smaller than a pixel, right? pixel at this scale. Um, <clears throat> so keep that in mind as we zoom out a little bit. Yeah, there are some pixels that small. And now you can see as we zoom out, that nebula is actually just kind of a small detail just left the center of the galaxy. And the galaxy extends quite a bit. Uh, this is only about a third like I said, it's about 60 degrees in east and west. That's about 120 degrees. So that's only about a third of the circle if you looked all the way around. <laughs> okay, so if you think that's big, Here we're showing a chunk of the universe about a billion light years across. So in this image, um, each of the small white dots that you see is a galaxy. Okay, so this is quite a bit larger. So these large clusters here are actually galaxy clusters. Galaxies tend to fall together due to gravity and form orbiting clusters of maybe hundreds or even thousands of galaxies. Sometimes the clusters fall together, except in this case, and you get what's called a supercluster. So note that the clusters tend to be, they're not randomly distributed, they tend to be kind of strung out, kind of in these long filamentary-like structures. Um, the filaments are kind of arranged, kind of like a giant web, some people call it the cosmic web. Um, and this is the largest scale structure that's known. And if you, if you look at a larger view than this, um, it just kind of repeats more of the same. The time span. So the time span here, the, this is a simulation that was done on uh, Pleiades upstairs, um, which generated, this is about half a petabyte of data, by the way, and it starts at about 13.7 uh, billion years ago, about redshift 100, so not too long after the Big Bang. And basically it starts with a fairly uniform distribution of matter, uh, with slight fluctuations uh, that are taken from cosmic microwave background data. And then the only physics being modeled here is gravity. So basically, the large-scale structure here is driven uh, entirely by gravity. The only kind of force that's long-range enough uh, to produce this. So that's the big picture. <laughs> so 
you thought the galaxy was big, just keep in mind there's kind of you know, maybe a thousand galaxies in one of these kind of medium-sized clusters. Um, and these were strung out in a pretty uh, intricate arrangement. So the image, images that you're looking at, by the way, these are dome masters um, for planetary use. It's actually shown in the Adler Planetarium, and we showed this at the Cal Academy also. So this is just looping. These are the uh, fairly uniform initial conditions. And you can see kind of the beginning of the structure formation. The thing just kind of comes into focus slowly. Um, and, uh, this is just due purely to gravitational instability. Um, this is a large ocean simulation, uh, global ocean simulation run on Pleiades, um, just showing the distribution of uh, near-surface currents um, on the planetary ocean. Um, we actually have repeated the globe twice, obviously, uh, so we don't have any edges uh, for any particular place you want to look. Um, and basically, the brighter the color here, the faster the current. Um, so you can see very fast currents, like the Gulf Stream here, and the Antarctic sort of polar current, kind of the southern ocean. Hurricane Alley. Yeah, Hurricane Alley. Um, the big equatorial jet here. Basically, you can kind of see that the oceans are kind of banded, kind of like Jupiter, in a way, and, kind of, and basically for the same reason. So basically, the flow on a rotating sphere uh, will tend to kind of uh, band out like this. But you also get these, you can see the dominant mid-scale features here are these, what are called mesoscale eddies. Basically, all these currents tend to curl up. Um, and that's due to Coriolis force, uh, which is greater as you uh, get to higher and higher latitudes. So you can see that the structures are very, very well developed um, kind of in the polar regions. Um, but because of the projection here, we're kind of uh, spreading out the data more in the, uh, in the high latitude regions. Um, so even though the, the Coriolis force is stronger in, in the so-called Rossby radius, the radius of turn gets smaller and smaller, we're kind of accounting for that in graphics so you see more and more detail as you go to the, to the polar region. So I doubt we're going to get any images this detailed from any exoplanets, but, uh, um, but there's actually a whole, a whole field of study now, um, basically trying to come up with different, studying atmospheric and also uh, oceanic circulation on planets with different parameters, different size planets, uh, different gravity, uh, different rates of spin, and so forth. Um, it's a pretty interesting field of study. Uh, Kepler is really giving a lot of motivation to that field. So this is measured or is this simulated? Uh, so this is simulated, but it is coupled to observational data. So one of the main determinants of this ocean circulation is what the atmosphere is doing. You can actually see signatures of storms. You can see these kind of eastward moving blobs. These are storms that are kind of pushing momentum into the ocean. Um, and the atmospheric forcing is from observational data. So that's taken from NASA satellite measured wind fields, and that's used as kind of the boundary condition for this. Um, but then the underneath that, we're solving the flow equations All right, so I hope that gives you kind of a brief idea of the sorts of capacity and calculations uh, that we're doing upstairs. Thanks. Thank you. Just sit here and watch it all day. Yeah. yeah, they're fun. They're fun it's to look cool. at. It's, uh, it's, a lot of, it's, it's a lot of data, and I hope we've made kind of how much data you can process on a supercomputer like Pleiades. It's really nice. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's sort of part of the cool power of having it so big is that you can really see the whole thing as a system that you can imagine. Conceive this like you are in this room looking at you know even something that size. Right. Just and and keep in mind generating something like this takes is a lot of data movement. So we're pushing a lot. Of, so what makes this thing really useful, this, besides the large displays, is that it's very tightly coupled to the supercomputers upstairs that you just saw. So we have a lot of bandwidth uh, down here. We can push over a hundred gigabytes a second uh, from the supercomputer graphics and machines down here. Um, and we need that sort of bandwidth to push the amounts of data uh, down that are being created. Uh, the Pleiades can create a lot of data really quickly. 
quickly. Um, and you just can't write that data to disk and deal with it later. Um, it's just too much data. Um, so you really need to kind of couple something like this directly to the, to the source of the data so we can see what's going on in these very large scale simulations. Um, we can actually show show DVDs on here. I mean, it's, uh, this I've is just that one uh, actually. I think the I think the data coming off the supercomputer is a little more interesting. <laughs> I would say too. Any other questions? Do you have to ever replace a screen? Uh, we actually haven't replaced any of these screens yet. So we have lots of spares. So the first shipment of these screens, they forgot to tie down the boxes. So we opened the truck, and there was just this jumble of boxes. So we refused the shipment. They ended up giving us, giving them to us anyway. So we ended up with an extra pallet of screens. But we haven't had to uh, replace any. How old is the? Uh, we built this system in 2008, so it's about four years old. Why not use the multi-projector system? Uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one, it's really, really hard. You couldn't get this many pixels with multi-projector. It would be really, really hard. And the alignment would just drive you nuts. Um, and you're probably thinking the motivation is to get rid of the bezels. Um, but basically, we like the bezels. Um, the large scale, the single images like we've been seeing here, are kind of the minor use. I mean, frankly, they're mainly for demos. Um, what we really like to do with this, primarily this is an engine for generating uh, visualizations from data off the supercomputer. And we want to do that in parallel so we can generate, we have 128 screens here, we can generate 128 frames of a movie or 128 different views um, from multi-physics simulations where there's a lot of different sorts of data coming down. But it does work reasonably well for a single image. You tend to kind of start looking for these But also with projectors, if you try to kind of make a seamless image, not only is the alignment hard, color balance is hard, and you actually tend to see the differences a lot more than you do on a, on a system like this, um, just because they're not supposed to be here. Here, when you get to when you get to a bezel, it's just over. It starts over. It's out. And yeah, so even though these aren't calibrated at all, there's actually fair. There's actually a fair amount of differences in these displays. They're aging a little bit differently and so forth. But you really just don't see it because of the bezels. Whereas in a projector system, uh, it really jumps out at you any kind of discrepancy or brightness difference. Um, this is like 16,000 or 20,000 pixels wide. 25,000 pixels wide and a 9,600 high. So it's a quarter billion. 